No U.S. president could ever be elected who did not give at least lip service to religion. Or again, visitors, especially from Europe, are always astonished at the friendliness of the populace here toward clergy and religious on the street, even in such a rough and tumble environment as New York City. Being greeted as a priest in public is a commonplace in New York City. It's a rarity in London, Paris, or even Rome. What kind of secularity would be beneficial to the church and to society? One which promotes pluralism, a concept espoused by most modern democracies, an approach which enables diversity to flourish within a unity of purpose, achieving unity without uniformity. From a religious perspective, that would mean not mere toleration of religious influences, but encouragement of them. Indeed, the very nature of a free society demands that all voices be raised and that all be respectfully heard, including religious voices. Believers need to be convinced, and then need to convince everyone else, that the fathers of Vatican II got it right when they declared in Gaudium et Spes, without the creator, the creature vanishes. History supports that assertion. Just look at the bloodshed of every godless movement of modernity, from the French Revolution to the Mexican Revolution and the Spanish Civil War to the murderous campaigns of the Nazis and Communists. Clearly, without the creator, the creature vanishes. Freedom of religion, as you should be able to see by now, is far more than being able to go to one's house of worship once a week. Because faith makes a claim on the totality of our lives, it permeates every dimension of a believer's existence and all the institutions with which he is involved. For the Catholic Church, which by her very nature exhibits a public face and presence, that means freedom for all our corporate works, emanating from our schools, healthcare facilities, and charitable programs. For the church to be the church, she cannot be muzzled in her proclamation of the truth of Jesus Christ. Whether that truth is proclaimed from the pulpit, in the classroom, in counseling sessions, or in lobbying for programs that seek to make the city of man look more and more like the city of God. Freedom of religion, as envisioned by our founding fathers, and as understood by the Catholic Church for two millennia, necessarily means the freedom not only to believe, not only to worship within the four walls of a church or a mosque or a synagogue, but to practice what one believes openly, fearlessly, and joyfully. Anything less is no more than a charade served up by every totalitarian regime in history that has sought to chain down the Word of God. However, St. Paul reminds Timothy and everyone else since then, there is no chaining down the Word of God. Intelligent and committed Catholics, then, must know what their God-given rights are, as well as their constitutional rights founded on those God-given rights, and to resist mightily, in every form possible, any effort to reduce freedom of religion to freedom of worship. As Barack Obama and his ilk doggedly move toward inhuman, ungodly, and yes, unconstitutional violations of conscience against Catholic and other religiously based institutions, we must be prepared to fight every such attempt while a fight is still possible. The movie, For Greater Glory, which I presume most of you have seen, documented the assaults on religious liberty during the Mexican Revolution. And I hope that if you have seen it, you took with you some lessons, especially the need to represent Christ and his church even under the most difficult circumstances. Those brave men, women, and children, yes, even children, clergy, religious, and laity alike, died with a triumphant cry on their lips and in their hearts, Viva Cristo Rey. Long live Christ the King. Ten years ago, anyone talking like me today would have been dismissed as a madman. So far removed was religious persecution from the American radar screen. In less than four years, 
we have seen a complete turnaround on that score. As Catholics and Americans, we have both the right and the duty to position ourselves in that long line of witnesses to the truth that Christ and his church can never be silenced by any earthly power. Failure to represent that cause would be a failure in both moral courage and civic responsibility, for which we would have to answer before the throne of the only power who matters in the final analysis, the one who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If we fight and lose, we should not be discouraged because we know that ultimately the cause of Christ's church always wins because of the divine promise that even the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. The resiliency and permanency of the church against all odds was a source of wonderment even to an evangelical, not at all friendly to Catholicism, like Lord Thomas Babington Macaulay, who could wax poetic about the indefectibility of the church with these stirring words as he looked back into history and peered into the distant future. He writes, there is not and never was on this earth a work of human policy so well deserving of examination as the Roman Catholic Church. The history of that church joins together the two great ages of human civilization. No other institution is left standing which carries the mind back to the times when the smoke of sacrifice rose from the Pantheon and when camel leopards and tigers abounded in the Flavian Amphitheater. The proudest royal houses are but of yesterday when compared with the line of the Supreme Pontiffs. That line we trace back in an unbroken series from the Pope who crowned Napoleon in the 19th century to the Pope who crowned Pepin in the 8th. And far beyond the time of Pepin, the August <coughs> Dynasty extends till it is lost in the twilight of fable. The Republic of Venice came next in antiquity, but the Republic of Venice was modern when compared with the papacy, and the Republic of Venice is gone, and the papacy remains. The papacy remains not in decay, not a mere antique, but full of life and youthful vigor. The Catholic Church is still sending forth to the farthest ends of the world, missionaries as zealous as those who landed in Kent with Augustine, and still confronting hostile kings with the same spirit with which she confronted Attila. The number of her children is greater than any former age. Her acquisitions in the New World have more than compensated for what she lost in the Old. Her spiritual ascendancy extends over the vast countries which lie between the plains of the Missouri and Cape Horn, countries which a century hence may not improbably contain a population as large as that which now inhabits Europe. The members of her communion are certainly not fewer than 150 millions. And it will be difficult to show that all Christian sects united amount to 120. Nor do we see any sign which indicates that the term of her long dominion is approaching. She saw the commencement of all the governments and of all the ecclesiastical establishments that now exist in the world. And we feel no assurance that she's not destined to see the end of them all. She was great and respected before the Saxons set foot on Britain, before the Frank had passed the Rhine, when Grecian eloquence still flourished at Antioch, when idols were still worshipped in the Temple of Mecca. And she may still exist in undiminished vigor when some traveler from New Zealand shall, in the midst of a vast solitude, take his stand on a broken arch of London Bridge to sketch the ruins of St. Paul's. Lord Macaulay penned those words in the 19th century, and they are just as true in the 21st. They are praxis. And that realization makes us confident, confident, not presumptuous, that the, cause, the justice of our cause and the one for whom we fight will be vindicated. It behooves us to keep ringing in our ears the wise words spoken by the late Bishop, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who warned us, a religion that does not interfere with the secular order will soon discover the secular order will not refrain from interfering with it. How can we ensure that the next generation will be willing to interfere with the secular order? Well, genuine pluralism demands a plurality of voices, which in turn needs a source for the development of those voices. Not surprisingly, every godless revolution has outlawed Catholic schools as its first offensive in attacks on the church, knowing that a church without schools is a church without a future. 
indeed at the very peak of a strong anti-Catholic movement in the United States, the state of Oregon actually attempted to outlaw Catholic schools, resulting in the 1925 landmark judicial decision vindicating the rights of parents in general and of Catholics in particular. Interestingly, it's the only Supreme Court decision of the United States ever quoted in a papal encyclical, namely Pius XI's Divina Alius Magistra. Robert Lynn's observations shed much light on where parochial schools fitted or did not fit into the whole, quote, American process. <coughs> According to him, the controversy over government aid to such institutions was frequently rooted in anti-Catholic prejudice, but even more important, it was due to some deeply held convictions about the nature of the public. He went on to explain the nature of those convictions. He writes, in the nation with the soul of the church, quoting Joseph, 